More than 30 years ago, Nuala and I read together in Clifton. I'd been reading her work and the editorial eye noting something phenomenal. A number of poets had started translating her poems. It included Paul Muldoon, Tom McIntyre, and Michael Hartnett. They were responding to some magnetic force, and I suggested gathering them and then inviting others, Seamus Heaney, Michael Cody, Elaine Nikhilanon, Maeve McGuckian, and Kieran Carson, to turn their heads and hearts and hands to her work. This they did with pleasure. The result was a book called Pharaoh's Daughter, and suddenly a wide world could glimpse the range of her gift. We followed that book by four other bilingual titles, two translated by Paul Muldoon, one by Elaine and Maeve, and most recently, Northern Lights by Elaine, Bernard O'Donoghue, Dennis O'Driscoll, and others. For Paul Muldoon, hers is one of the most interesting bodies of work in contemporary poetry. His most recent collaboration, The 50-Minute Mermaid, features merfolk who are at odds with themselves, psychologically as much as physically, in their dryland existences, and are trying to make sense of their own translated <coughs> lives. Drawing on Irish folklore, her poems report exactly contemporary states of mind, and sometimes they're dirty as hell. <laughs> Much as we wish Kieran were here with us, Nula's most welcome. She is brilliant and beloved, intrepid and treasured. To think of Nula's own poems and the translations they prompted might make us consider a double you or double she. To come to David Harson to write poems and libretto, and under the names Jack Curtis and David Lawrence, crime novels, might make us contemplate not a double, but a treble you or treble he. I haven't read the fiction, but I'm tempted to read one that has in it a drug dealer called John, is it John Stone? John Stone. I mentioned the range of Nuala's poetry, and I might have been referring to David Harsnitz, for the reach of his attentions and concentrations is also remarkable. His book Legion is a rumination on war. What is perhaps my favorite of his collections, Marriage, dwells on the mysteries of domesticity by imagining the relationship between Pierre Bonheur and his long-term companion and model, Martha de Melini. Such is their thematic strength that each of his books reads like a project, a sequence of poems based on the hair draws on folklore surrounding that creature as much as Nuala's merfolk, and brings to the, my mind the crow poems of another great poet with associations with devil. David Harson's can be a world of dreams and nightmares. The first poem in his selected begins, it was a violent country, explosions and raw sunsets, inexplicable cries, <clears throat> The same poem speaks of a bad omen. In marriage, where a formal grace, variations on terza rima support the narratives, remembering the severity, the serenity of Bonar's interiors, it's a surprise to read. You remember that movie, don't you? The banged up Pontiac? Red Hot Jazz from the Radio, 
until you remember that Bonnard died in 1947, and books and films such as The Postman Always Rings Twice were part of popular culture. As we see the strands of the lovers' lives pull into a knot, we encounter the erotics of food and taste. A poet who imprints an image that you know you'll never forget is one to treasure. He has in a poem an albino child tiptoeing through playtime in negative against the wood's penumbra. That's as vivid as it's indelible. <coughs> if I were to read the list of prizes David Harson's work has accrued, we'd be here till the early hours. For Pat Cotter to have assembled this lineup of this year's festival is a coup. It is both Cork and international. And we're witness of this in this evening's most welcome guest. First, we're going to hear from David and then from Nuala. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I'm sad not to be reading with Karen, but I'm glad to be reading with you. The last time we read together was in Istanbul, <laughs> in fact. The poems in Salt are all very short. And were I to read them one after the other, it would be a bit like scrolling. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is leave a wee gap, a little pause between each of the poems. And it would help me, and I hope it would help you, and it would help the poems, were you not to look at me while I was reading. Um, sort of close your eyes, look at the back of the chair in front of you, look to the side, look at your feet, don't go to sleep. <laughs> um, and the idea is, and I think it's the only way to actually read from this book, that if you're not looking at me and wondering when I'm going to start the next poem, then my voice will fall, the poem will fall uh, on your ears. Um, unexpectedly. So as I say, these are very short. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to read from Salt and then I'm going to finish the reading with a section from my new book, um, which my publisher was startled to discover was ready before this one was published. <laughs> and is going to be published in January. There are no titles to these poems. But I might just read um, this little note um, about them. I said, the poems in this book belong to each other in mood, in tone, and by way of certain images and words that form a ricochet of echoes, not least the word salt. They are a series, not a sequence. Although my intention was that the poems be read as wholly independent of each other, it became apparent as I wrote that some loose, disjointed narratives were developing, small broken chains of hint and harmony. So if you can bear to indulge me in this. She turned towards him, then she turned her back. Early sunlight washed into the room, then something like the half-heard whine of flywheels, or music composed for the gesture, not the sunlight. The sky brighter than before, rushes and salt flats, white, broad-winged birds that landed standing like 
angels who are known by all to be salt eaters. Then the scapegoat in the full flower of his pathos, the friendless die first, little tumours seek them out, or their blood sickens in them. Their sure curative is melancholy, but they sing and sing to hold off the dark. If only it were true that she'd had her first sight of him as he crossed to the, crossed to the Café Braunhoff, that they lied to one another by agreement, that the house had mirrors in every room, that they ate her afterbirth, that his hair turned white overnight. <laughs> Helix Pomartia inside a circle of salt. We endow that purification, just as we scatter salt over slugs to have them writhe in cleanliness, just as we lavish salt on a flogged man's back. The door was open and the room was dark. There is a stillness that lies beyond sound, beyond sense. It gathers to find its true weight. Nothing survives it and it cannot break. He cleared snow from the path and threw down salt. He was conscious of oxygen then. The word, also the way his breath came back at him to leave a trace of ice on his upper lip. This soon after dawn, the sleepers in the house fixed like the dead, except one who turned in her dream looking for elbow room. Her voice just short of reaching him, the snowfall soundless, the salt finding its way, the scuff of his boots in all that ghostliness. That sudden stillness will catch you out, like driving into a cul-de-sac, becoming lost among trees, not knowing the language, going naked in a house you used to know or think you did. Rags of piety, the way your mind ransacks the celestial, how a bird in flight locks off in memory. Coldness was a blessing to you then, hoarfrost underfoot, ice over slow water, the way things dimmed in white. Weep for it now, yes, weep. It can't come back. <coughs> Whorehound and lupin, stewed, salt with necessity, lees and leavings, slops, bone ash, dieback and dreck, hemp. Her blood, the ejaculate of the damned. <coughs> <coughs> then
They salted the streets and posted red weather alerts. He turned her out of bed and there it was, the little fiction he had planned for. Her reflection held four square in the bedroom window, driven snow under the coming dawn. Her sudden silent prayer was commonplace, to betray but do no harm, to admix guilt with love and that the way to get the best of it, to let each salty lie roll on her tongue, to gamble with heartbreak, to give an account of herself that would seem most like herself. Hands of the puppeteer are chafed by love. His people dance and clap and jabber and kiss by knocking heads. Their names are known only to him. If they lie to one another, his fingers ache. Husband and wife and lover and stranger and fool, they fall into themselves, find common ground, go side by side. Blood toil, brooch out of bone, given over from wolf or bear, paper thin and done by firelight, the scrape of flint, the dense, deep odour of smoke. It could only have come to him by theft. She pinned it on and the ground gave under her. Her blood blossomed in the water trap and her voice came as a rolling echo from an empty room in a place long since lost to the world. His ghost tugged to be free. He lay all, dead in bed, or he lay all day in bed. People he knew or once knew filing past and fading as they reached the limit of his love. The dead are given permission to walk among us. They smile dead smiles. They have no need for speech. The familiar goes for nothing. Each evening, they hold up to our windows their silent, smiling children. Rough sleepers turn away and fold into their stench. Scholars of the omphalos and asshole. Go by, go by. Soon they will rise as one, a long silhouette snaking between taillights and start the final journey to Axis Mundi. The pavement artists have your likeness that coal black broadcloth suit, that whiskey stagger. <clears throat> she walked from street to street. She might as well have been cloaked and masked. It seemed to her that she left her reflection in windows, her breath a stain. 
the blood let go from her womb, a sudden jolt. It's fine, she told herself. I'll arrive and be welcome as before. My children will put me to bed. I'll sleep with the light on. Finally then, how last light falls as it settles on empty streets. How dawn light fails, how it fails to bond. How dew comes in as salt to scar the window pane. Now walk into the world outside with hand to heart. How slight things seem, how close to that slow fade, the edge of sleep, blur of lost focus, of memory beyond remembering. You are loved, of course, though it doesn't tell on you. As lewd nocturnal, as night nurse, as someone to fetch whiskey and pen and paper and books on a dolly dish, with photographs given in sequence so the tale is properly told, and item one, and item two, which must remain unnamed, and something to eat you won't eat, and something to wear you won't wear. As you open your mouth to speak, she lowers herself onto you, moth soft, and you take yourself up into her as a last resort. Waking at the dead hour, blinds open to moonlight, your silhouette sharp cut on a wall, white as bone, as salt. Both this and a vision of this, one set down on the other, the moon itself and a version of itself. The room, a place you might come to, or soon abandon. And it rises now, a pain behind your eyes, touching the sclera, touching the nerve, rag ends of a dream, where you find your lover in her husband's bed. See it out, see it out. Each breath of dead weight, each passing thought masquerading as your last. All night wide-eyed in that backwash of white-blue light, so your pulse goes with the tides and her blood too where the ache in a turning wave is a vacancy in air, as if music might break the silence, or silence be endless. So that's all from Salt, and I'll finish with this song. I'll finish with this piece from, uh, I'll finish with this section from Lost, I was having lunch with my friend Hugo Williams, who said, what's your new book called, David? And I said, Loss. And he said, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, each of the sections, there are 20 sections in this new book, and each of them consists of an unrhymed sonnet, some lines, short line, a short line sections, sort of jagged, kind of syncopated, uh, verse, and the whole thing ends with a rhymed quatrain. The only thing I will say about this is that you will pick up, I'm sure, at the beginning of the short line section, the, a, a little um, moment from the board about Tam Lin, where Tam Lin's lover, Janet, has to wait at a crossroads at the dead of night uh, and wait until Tam Lin, who has been kidnapped by the fairy band, comes past and she must drag him from his horse and hold him tight no matter what terrible creature they turn him to and then he'll be saved. <clears throat> I first read 
Tamley and I first read the Border Ballads when I was 11 or 12 years old. There's a moment when <coughs> Janet is crouching at the, I imagine her crouching at the crossroads. Crossroads, of course, terrifying places because it was where men were hanged or gibbeted. Uh, the, no <coughs> the notion being that their souls wouldn't know which way to go. And, um, oh, that's my wine, I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the Tamlin poet says, <clears throat> about the dead hour of the night, she heard the bridles ring. And I remember when I was 11 or 12 reading that, and it just, my whole body fizzed, and it still does to this day. <clears throat> so, um, the sonnets are an account of our principal character. The short line sections are an address to him, and the quatrain is, as it were, a summary. So thank you for inviting me. I'm glad, I'm delighted to be here in court for the second time. And uh, I'm delighted to be reading it. This room now, papers and books, a long drift over tables, over chairs to the floor. She said, you'll find him here, up to his arse in the tar pits of poetry. Find him lost in some landscape of the mind, the mind's perfect drear, salt marsh as moonscape, as snowscape, as white over white, which is limitless from skyline to skyline. She said, there are ghosts here that crowd and jostle. They feed off silences and wait for nightfall. And I will turn cards to find what's left for him, what's left for me. With that, a shift in her womb, the unnamed child. Sometimes he lies down with these rejects. His finger bones ache. He imagines them blacked by a lifelong seepage of ink. Among the crosshatched deletions, one line untouched. She said, this comes not from the scar, but from the wound. She is the girl waiting at the crossroads about the dead hour of the night in the face of fear's magic and whispers from the gibbet, ready to haul you down and hold you fast no matter what ugliness you come to. She is your lost bride and the heart's failsafe. Full moon in midwinter stillness is death in abeyance, as blood slows and you are held in that pale light, frostfall and a caught breath. There is no true healing, not at the well of sorrows, not at the whipping post, not at the communion rail, Christ's fire break, not in the hall of mirrors, where you are set to rights, not in a basement bar, where you sit down to a whiskey chain and fall and rise and fall back into a raw dawn light <clears throat> over high rise slumland, whose people each new day go blind to daybreak, numb to the toxic wind. You know too well their turf war battle song their live-by, die-by graffiti. You know their stopless need. Somewhere far from this, a cloudburst hits the glitter field. A hawk rides the thunderhead. It is sure evidence of grace that stones glow in a tarnished light, that the sound of the sea pushes back against the sound of the rain that she can bring you here with a gesture that sets you among the stones and bird in the churn of the weather and the arc of the sublime. Prayers are raised against havoc and harm. 
tyranny goes by another name. Word is sent from the sightless to the dumb. The storm horse gallops through the firestorm. much of blot in the eye shot, nor any soul that I know missing, I've counted them all, each one, and they're all present and correct. Still, it seems to me my hands are sticky with the smell of blood. I swear my hands are sticky with the smell of blood. I've rummaged underneath the mattress, in cubby holes behind doors, for fear of a rotting king or courtier, Polonius behind the arras, my lurk behind the smell of blood that's sticking to my hands. Hell's freezing over with sour water, and the icy cataracts pour from the tap. My hands are hacked, the skin is all volcanic, cracks from this eternal pumice stone, and I don't know how many bars of sunlight soap have shrunk into exhausted slivers since I'm stuck with the smell of blood that's on my hands. Blonde the fuller. Gushi mistap blonde the fuller candle to the malaw. Cain of a lane rain na smear the fish can na ain of them lock the antis and that's not. Corey me eat a raggle in a hug that give them well how to lay the law her force our limb will blonde the fuller. Cangle to the law. Though my lower on the fuller, cangle to the law. For them, they appear the vatras, they call in styre, ashtir the horus, they hunt on corpri no flaha, polonius low, they have here the norris, they ne'er a blunt foot shot no fuller, and they cangle to the law. Ta ifrin durical lawn dishki mother. A scummy fora attacked on walker, Tom a law on the lagoon, a crick and gargara, the brisha or the quad or her less triggers. If another came in, got loom of sunlight, eat a hair, and ashka, gun pots, gun parifer, marble rum, good do, to make blonde the fuller, cangleton, the malaw. She and Father will, um, on, 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 I guess um uh Sidere the uh the Nathers came in Swiss Lat Chukka 
um, um, Karen the, 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 and Lainey Quilmnall, I could um, um, bother her again. I guess our signature, Jindira, and I could have to get up for I guess Hannah, Tana, the Kair, and the Kutu Dui, I guess, and Kudela, Korele Heligan. So, um, it's like Peter Fallon and then Antastri Kwanza. The Northern Lights, or Aurora Borealis, the mellow and melodious lamentation of the globe rounding on its axis, the rustling of clear wind above the empty em awfulness, this world's indomitable poem, its loosened prayer, lighting up old fields of forces. This earthly tongue's syllables are grounded once again, and then again rumbling in dark clouds, bright, then green, like closing curtains. And the way. And the way of the week, bug bean, a grinna, a cassa, a refarsid. Just gonna gree her green there, a skin full loose on the agon. Don muscle on down, a fatter gal, excites you and magnetic there. Did him brave him the tannin down the saharam, Kantalov, Kown, her Kown, in the near to Bolnes Witney, Ernos Pratini. Marem, for his Huska Fairbanks, Alaska, and for them, and then Aurora Borealis, I guess, um, Krishna Asmagarna, we is near, near, near a colleague of the country law, and my yard, I guess, um, Kahas fought Mak my other, I guess, where is Mak Barek graven down more magnetosphere, I guess, great and green and green and down green that I checked at the West, I guess, Trish Tamil, Nathan, Amy Ella on an orbit, a reducadish and Padre Yell, Nathan, Queen of Er Amy Akashin. I guess the session is for an audience, so I'm going to say that. So, um, so um, kind of um, our, um, our um, fair uh, uh, Maria, uh, well, uh, well, for she was, I guess, that Brahmid Galeer and Smuin of the last year. I guess I know. Um, Quid is her dot tache, good chicken or island dove, Akam, not a rock fiction. In memory of Shame Seamy, again, as um, Peter Fallon has done the translation. As if a mighty tree collapsed deep in the forest, the sound it made was heard and felt as far as the far east. That resounding din reached us a drift of heart and home. We knew at once and on the spot the king of the woods himself succumbed. As I leaned, though keened, there was in our hearts a rent. Nothing could soothe or treat or mound. Not all of Munder, Munster, nor the Smiths of Ireland, Oh, he was our boy, our lively lad, our own sweet prince, the very one we'd have to hand to play for us as he led us the whole way along towards the promised land. In memoriam, Seamus Heaney. Fame are a hit of crown moor, Ilarn of Arisha, and her loud in she, hit she, the Hulas, the Hulas, and the Dawan Hire. Hul Marna Fain and Thuart. Kegaramur, Gavad Ovaila. Is Hegemar Loira, is Erin Dirt. Gre Gre Nakhila, her Lar. Is Fain or Dirt Island of Fado, is Arar Gre Viku. Now Lysak, Kuigamun. 
naar deine elan avion. De beer aan moer bioe, aan jelle maar, aan rauwe, aan bierbere. De heintje suis, de vakker schim, goedie, tjeer, talingra. De gaas is de gaas mies, a kreen of, er, um, daar, um, er, aan koe, na lijst of koe gemoen, na lijst of koe gemoen, ek is, weet je, goed, my kou, gerees de My care, hic opus hic labor est, Virgil. Somewhere out in the country, in South Chip, I saw a sign for the castle. And although I was pressed for time, I left the ring road on impulse and drove down to it. Care. Care, I said. My care. My dearest woman friend slowly dying in the Adelaide. The photograph of the two of us, one March in Ankara, young, smiling up from the death seat with no matter care in the world. Or the Muslim woman in Algiers in yesterday's paper, her arms raised and hearing that eight of her children had, to, had their throats cut. Was it true that the commander of a Serbian prison camp was a poet? That a literary historian played football with somebody's head? <coughs> Women say so. That would say anything. My own husband in a coma for six days and me looking out of the window at the sky between Dunlaira and Hope Head, at the tides coming and going, and the life of the whole of Ireland, then speeding by, a throng as unconcerned as the leaves on a spring tree, to make space for all this without exploding, to wall up the heart as firm as care's motion baby, so as to answer her tired question about my children, how is the care? That is the task. That is the task that is not easy. Another. And Mota is Babu Narmanach Akonakashach, she cartoon from. It's made the Mont Harbroid, the topic here in Mohar, or the egg in Kendua, in Akalek Kilnaiman, in Kundanami, or Kugananan Donar. Shinny, another. A shin is in the law, it sounds to the my fault wash the mouth in the hospital on Adelaide. And grief graph he is in Boca, Birch, a Namla Oga, a Tok La Morta, in Kieda Ariki, Nardin the Law in Ankara. Shinagardi is gone to him, a bin a Kadavi ruined. I am a muscle me all and on a gear of Nukledi in the in Sunnathorn, the Rahinchi. For our station school, not the era of the land of old Darklam, on Philip and Roger Serbic of Ian Canary or Moor County Gavin, and Sari Lichita, a academic sir in the heart, a gimmer place, a gimmer cadet, le place plena. Markele Kahan Law, She Law, Egoma, Smefia, and the Mac Finoga, and Shomra Fehek, or in Solos, a Daruku, a Moher Ma, it a dun layer, it was beyond needed. Zer hack is a mathematician, talk trauma and more, or a willing self folder, a gim act of Rihatal as a now, a plodo and most of the nilo, a pick or garrach and crown. A chevalier of Hort Fenera, a sort of Yenata, a Cree, Gantleska. A chevalier is a motor Norman of a knock, a watch and ski, or take and fend door, inaculate kill by and on, a boon and a me. 
a number, shimmy a number, shimmy a number, mak eska. Um, 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 you, whoever you are, you are true. The one with an ear may be deep enough to hear out a woman who tells of budging, dodging between bullets to make good her escape. We didn't reap summer together in our winter quarters. We didn't stow our way to America or sow wild oats, oats in regions of unimpeded heat. We didn't skim the mountain tops on a sleek black steed. We didn't shelter under a rowan while night patch plots of hoar frost, nor sweltered by a bonfire with victory's bugle sounding from on high. Beneath us spilled the saltiness of the sea. Between us rose hills and mountains out of range. Tusa, Estus of Pehu Hain, and Firain, Hogan Puss, Le Hesta Fader, the Van Ainge to Scale, a Hogan Cossalea Regan, O Wahid and Kaha. Near Hugumar Fain, and Sarilin, Nangira. Near Hrailimar, our Bordinga, Gomericana, now a lot of our fortune, Le Kalish, Lear Bait, and Snatiers. To her there. Near Gaimer, the Born of Nock, is a happy lauder all in the Near Liam or Fay Crown Clarehead is an Ia for Krishna. Near Loom or Vitinta Kana is an Ia Koshida or Haven again. Adderin, be an Aragavur, a Tagrona. Adderin, be a Knick, is an Stager, Makassan, or Haven. Um, this um, here, um, um, Alan Glana, I guess, Knock, um, Look, last the West one. We, we say long, we say long the the um, the the the, the, the um, Ganiede. I guess and some has neither. I guess has neither. We go to the Lovale. I guess has neither. I do a dear to the Shack Savariga. I guess how 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 does he call how hashtags and where um goes Chris Glana. Signs of fish off sleigh head. As we sailed around from the Blasket at Glown Fawn River, we were struck by the tangle of gulls and gannets, hundreds strung out to the height of who knows how many spades. Spa 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 when gannets began to, fall, to descend on us, like the fallout of a hail shower or bullets storming from the epicenter of a war, the sound was so explosive as they hit the water, the aftershock disturbed us for a long time. For at least as long as it took to round the corner of Barkmore Point. Corey Ish began to stay. Attack the weather on the Iran, a gun on Diana. Be clearly more of Ghana the sweet on, who put he had round or at. A gang you was cune the gown in Amstralina one. The hit gan either in a come a kit that natta. Ho two let all, no coggle my belair. Two, two, two. A dort cachanaka, a dolvarica. Lam the tolunusen, evad ovale. Lam no mo crimer deem a jetter, quincha, and porta. Um, yeah, Griff no me le 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 um um kuchu le le aim um uh like le kaun kaun is far from her father's night has to gone. I guess it's um Lenny Hulanon. You know, I guess tukunche tukunche sasa kaun rakta dum kuskis and bonda. Um. And can um, a yinchina rise up little bird? 
Shannon, the enemy, not Jenna Peter Craig, August Birma, um, Lahisla. Rise up, little bird, high in the tree, and grab the topmost branch with your claws. Call out gaily at the top of your voice your glorious syllable of sound in a single gush of note. Then do it again and consider it twice or three times the basic facts of my kind of animal. Say, though I've lost my treasure, don't think that I've lost my wits. And though great is my sorrow, there's no end to the music of life. Iri gaini ni marin na greya, isperer ni ag uachter ni tu chuchui. Skol maca hair o canar de gaha se hin de chalagor for fuame in an skona wain na ti. An sun din arishte is mearik le do nu fechi na firi ki bani na mi lehe te anevi. Aber kegar chalis ma stor na doko ko chalis ma kio es kega morai mo bron na petora le kio tante. Rise up and announce to us who live with all the passion that fills your heart and your breast that the milch cows are grazing in the meadow by the river. Grass and iris is up to their ears. They chew the cod steadily, leisurely, trust and patience visible in their gentle eyes. Although the butcher lorry awaits them and the fluke is hidden under the watercress in the swamp. Iri quis currinu duina of iron the buck left made and talked to Elian on the tree, stopped. The wind of Abanegi near in Snumone for Shaun fell as from a sphere of Oka Fuslaha, yet the coven the keer of Galeir, Malfriola, when he is final like Fishkin to the Sula Shave. Kegor will lorry on Bushjera a fehevlo, is an lay, Ishke Evalach, a scar on Villar and Save. The, the, there are three women with great rayon night ha, 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 headscarves on pilgrimage to St. John the Baptist, Baptist well at Minard. They have come from camp and from Dingle. They are sweating in their crumpling dresses with the high heat of the August day. The south, <coughs> south, south is one, one raises her voice, saying the rosary in country English, decade after decade, her voice raising and falling like the bee buzz of a bee or a corn crib. The green flies are laying eggs on the blackberries in front of them. The will sure ban fe scarf on a serga, a truck torch and trust, a tubberm nave and nave minarda and the minarda a tagaha of us on gang with on nang and the curb begun in Alish and a moon egg crimping a maiden tassel a lunasa. Or the in and down this rear a car go around the crona from Maryland and Duhe. Denuris in the Denur, Ig Ardo Igus Agishu, Margorda and Behena, no Trine, Tana Kulina Glassa, Aglaha Ov and the Smear of Zakor. Tell that there's a plump woman tourist over from England in a yellow bikini rising out of the wave, walking across to the door of her GB camper and drying herself with a striped towel beside the fence. That her belly is smooth and tanned by the sun, her grapes like her breasts like grapefruit, shapely and sunned. A comb on her right hand, a bottle of loxine in her left, nothing missing to make her a Venus except for the scallop shell. <laughs> in this with Tohim Trasora and Nuas and Nuas Naolo Sasna, Miki Vui Egeri as in the Yeshu Trasna Gudoris and Camper GB is let's to our left striper. Akshimu fein and glee. The will of Bullock Shim is we on grain, a kir from our grapefruit core of this cream. Kir grey in a jasso, it would yell shampoo lapsin in a log cake, than the ye her marvenous of a wine and slig on marine. Rise up and sing your heart out. You don't know that a sad middle aged woman walks down the road, crossing the sand dunes going down the farm road, pushing a damaged child before her. A cloud hangs over the woman, her face is across, her elastic stockings are bothering her in the heat, although she knows the pain in her varigose veins would be worse if she were to take them off. I read this her the Kriamach, and I missed it, I didn't I didn't know that I didn't know that I didn't 
Det er skammen du er, så er det mennesker, så er det pusser, 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 Now grab your chance that the child will hear you. Sitting up in the pram, he clapped his hands together and laughed and let his mother would, would know in his own way, Mommy, leave for your thoughts and your sadness for a while. There's a little bird singing his head off in the treetops. Connemach, a hard, a scon, a cream, a a small, a boar, a paragraph, a quid spot, a cur, a rile, a spow, a rum. Tell me, a nish, a hans, a blushy, a lenata, say, sit it to us, a pram. Bwyrig o fosar y chelis, tian y goer i, ys cwynig yn nŵl da fawr, a wam, cwyr swys ys nos mwyn ys yn dwrch ys hamol, ta eini'n a chana, a'r dala, a'r bara, a'r grawn. The woman will look up from the deep dark fog that floats around her, and she will get courage and wit. In the wink of an eye, a sunbeam will reach through the cloud of self-pity that's destroying her, and a hint of a smile will spread on her lips. I see the smile, and I prefer it. There's a sound of our tears, and I know that you well deserve praise for a thing so small, your ardent twittering, evidence of the fun and the pain that are part of being alive, my dear little bird, my own image. Fiafig and Van and Nies of St. Gil, Mother Goraka, are following the temple, is glacish, she mishna, is keel. You grab on the soul, she need cut on the angel and nail, came through the Thaumille, is big, is Thaumille. Is lahig fa an gaire reveal? Kim sin gaire? Gud is fairly main na fa a gur. Is tigh mo gurma an rodlit an mala the rod copia. The scala na mire mar ianisha er an atis is an fian. A wedin na marin mo galta hain ini gurmi na gur. Yeah. What is the effect for both of you of, of writing sequences? Because you both read a sequence of po a sequence of short uh, poems to us. What propels you to write a sequence? Well, there wasn't there wasn't there wasn't so much a sequence of. Uh, <coughs> Poems of so many different poems that come from all over the workplace. Um, but sequences, yes, sequences, when I have an idea and I begin to work it out and it doesn't, and it, it, it's not right, then I have another go at it and another go at it and another go at it. And that's the way I get a sequence like. Um, uh, the sequence about the people coming up in land, or, or the the, the um, mermaids, mm -hmm. who, are, who are just transmogrified. Um, that's, that's what, the way it happens. Okay. I, um, I think uh, there are assumptions that uh, uh, poetry is largely speaking autobiographical, um, but I think it probably is largely speaking not. And certainly my poetry is not. I write little fictions. And um, sometimes I come down after I've been working in the evening and my wife, who was an actor, so understands these things, said, will say, have you been torturing your people? <laughs> um, and because, it, because, of the, because of the fiction, one thing tends to lead to another. In other, in other words, um, you know, I, I like the notion of things being episodic. Um, I like the, the notion of bringing a new light to bear on something from a different angle that you think you've seen. Um, and quite often, language is the impulse. So that um, I was seized recently by a sort of, well, I call it a sort of compositional firestorm 
Um, my son, my elder son, refers to it as a rush of shit to the brain. <laughs> um, anyway, recently, and you may well see the effect in me, <laughs> I wrote 28 poems in 30 days, and I really feel in need of hospitalization. <laughs> Um, but it is to do with this business of an impulse, it's to do with the notion of things carrying on and, and carrying over. And if you invent circumstance and you invent character, which is what I do, which is why I used to write, well, I used to write crime fiction, it was a way of making a living. I mean, if I'd been a rich man, I'd never have done it, but it'd be the hell out of going to the office. Um, so this business of, of fiction um, needing room to breathe, and needing needing expansiveness, needing episodes, um, is is what causes is what brings me to the sequence, um, the, the, the development of the story, um, but not in a in a through narrative, but in a series of episodes. Yeah. Didn't, um, didn't, um, my, I don't know, is this working? Yeah. Just, uh, didn't, um, Rilke say, work that out in when he was doing the Dueno elegies and the, um, the poems, the poems for the guard, they came almost of, it, of their own. Mm. In, in, yeah. So it's almost the same thing. I, I sort of find that, I mean, for example, in this um, sequence I've been writing over the last month or two, um, which I call the Weirds, uh, because they're quite strange poems, I don't know quite what's going on in them. I dare say they'll reveal themselves to me. Um, sometimes an image um, doesn't work for poet. They, they, they're, 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 they consist of, of three tercets, uh, each separated by an asterisk so that they're not, you know, they're, they are themselves episodic. Um, an image or a line that will give rise to an image in the way that things begin with a sort of whiff of something, you know, like a smell of burning or first, or like a, a wee nudge in the rib, ribs, you know. Um, so an image that that falls out of one of those little triple tercets, you know, will fall onto the next page, as it were. Um, you know, it will fall onto the next page in the notebook or the next space in the notebook, or sometimes the next page on the computer, you know. Um, and and it will just it will give rise. It will it will be like a little um, like a little egg. You know, it's ab over. It, it, it's it's um, it's a new beginning before the other poem has been completed, and so it's it, it's like a little chain of creation of uh, composition going on, and so sort of long way it continues, but um, but it's testing, taxing. Yeah. David, may I ask, is that why you were attracted to variations on? The Turks of Lima, because it is that kind of chain link. Yeah, for just that reason, I think. Yeah. 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 It work? But I think we call 28 poems in 30 days showing off. <laughs> <laughs> they might be no good. <laughs> Who knows? Is there anyone else? Please. Yeah. Uh, I wonder sometimes, it's so inevitable now, everything you write will be translated into English. You know, people can't keep their hands off the boards. When you have anything to say about it or not, people are avid to do it. Do you ever feel the sense of nervousness that the foreshadowing of the English version is going to press back against the Honda against the original efforts? <laughs> it doesn't. It, it has. It's um. It's to do with the rhythm of a, of a language, the way the rhythm of 
of the language will work in your head with, before you actually have the words, the rhythm, rhythm of the language is working in your head. And it's always in Irish. I mean, I thought now that, that, that I, I couldn't even try to write in English. Any other mm -hmm. No, the reason I ask is because more and more now in Connemara Irish, for instance, it isn't just the Berlachas that's coming in, the, you know, the increasing presence of loan words from English and Irish, but the syntax is pushing back from English into Connemara Irish. I don't see, find that in Belg and the Moon, I don't find that in your poems. But do you, do you see it happening out there in the language? Yeah, but uh, that's going to happen anyway. Mm. I mean, that's going to happen anyway because of the, of the development of language. I mean, uh, the, the language my grands, my grandchildren speak is something different to what I would speak. And I keep, you know, I keep correcting, you can't say that. And they say, how can I say more? And you just tell you can't say that. And they say, well, what do you say? How can I say more? And they say, well, nobody, here, nobody talks like that now. You know? <laughs> no. And that's how it is, you know. But I mean, uh, the Department of, of Folklore is such an extraordinary um, jewel that, that the country doesn't know about. Um, you have know, two million, you have two million pages of, of material, wonderful material, and then a hundred, hundred, uh, hundred, well, a hundred, hundred million. Well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I'm not going to say, um, and an awful lot of, of other things as well. I mean, if, if you do, do nothing else except except read it, the um, the natural language of the of the, the time of the well, people spoke mostly in the fifties, forties, thirties, forties, fifties. I mean, it would it would change it would change your your life. No, no, most of, yeah, but most of, mostly, the stuff I read is mostly 50s, 40s, you know, you know, it's, it's a wonderful stuff. Yeah, have hand up. Hi. First of all, thank you, that was fantastic, thank you. It kind of speaks to the chat question you said about the original versions versus the translated versions, but also what um, David had said when he started it. It was almost like you were trying to isolate not the performance but hearing the words rather than reading them and i was wondering whether for both of you whether it was the translated to english version or the original written version if there was any pieces that you'd written that you wouldn't perform for whatever reason that whether the rhythm wasn't there or whether the sentiment if if there was something you just wouldn't want to perform I'm afraid I didn't hear that. I'm sorry I didn't hear that. <laughs> Are their translations so bad that you wouldn't want to repeat them in public? <laughs> sorry, say again? Are their translations of your work so bad that you wouldn't want to repeat them in, in public? Translations I make or translations of my works? Of your work. Sorry. Just simply because when you started your performance you said, you know, don't concentrate on what I'm doing, what I'm saying, it's more the words. It, it was interesting to me that there's so many poets at the moment that are purely performance-based. They write to perform, whereas uh, it seemed like you were performing because you wrote it. So if there was any poems that you had written that you would simply not perform. Um, well, it's interesting you use the word perform. I mean, I write for the page, um, and I try and... I, I hope this is answering your question. Um, I should have put my hearing aids in. <laughs> um, uh, what was it who said, you know, getting old is for sissies? Um, uh, I, I try and, when I'm reading um, to an audience, I try and do the best job I possibly can. And my only advantage in this is that my wife, as I say, is an actor. Um, and when I first knew her, which is a very long time ago now, uh, I gave a reading at what was then the Poetry Society in Earl's Court Square, and she came to the reading. I didn't really know her all that well. Well, I mean, I did, but 
you know, we hadn't been together all that long. And she hadn't been to a reading of mine. And when we came out, I said, was that okay? And she said, oh, yes, yes. You could try not coughing at the end of every line. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, give me, give me a hint, give me a clue, you know. So she did, and, and I, so I try now to, to, to give a performance when I'm reading. I'm not, I'm not in any kind of stagey, you know, pompous, uh, sort of voice flexing kind of way, but, but, but to, you know, to, 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 to deliver the poems in, in a way that is, you know, you know, to some small degree dramatic perhaps, and, so forth, because that's what reading out loud is. If you read to a child, um, you know, uh, you, you don't sort of read a storybook in a flat, unemotional voice where events are sort of passed over, barely noticed, and so on and so forth. You bring some drama to it. You give the characters or the animals or whatever it is different voices and, uh, and try and endow them with characteristics and so on and so forth. So. So in order to keep the child's attention or, or not have them hate you, uh, um, you know, you try. And so I, 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 I do my best to, to, to interest, interest the audience, but I write for the page. So I can't think of a poem, if that's what you said, that I wouldn't read, but there are some poems I've written that read better, I think, to an audience, but, but, but then their place, for me anyway, is on the page. It's not to say I'm not sneering at performance poetry. I'm just saying I don't, I don't, um, I, I, I write, I think performance poetry, there's an immediacy about performance poetry that, um, that there is a great deal to do with entertainment. Whereas I suppose I write in a sense to be reread, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I, I write, I, I write in a way that I hope will bring the reader to a sort of contemplative state, so that when um, when I first published, when Salt was first published, I would say to people, and indeed I'm now saying it to you, <laughs> were you to buy a copy of this book or steal it or whatever, um, it, it, for me, the best way of reading Salt, even if it took you all year, would be to read one of those tiny poems. I mean, the longest poem in the book is a, is a sonnet. It's the, the poem I read last from that book. There, there's one poem that's only one line long, many are three, five, six lines long, um, would be to read one of those poems a day and, and, and go back to it, try and hold it in your mind, think about it, dwell on it, dwell on it. Or, or at least read one in the morning and one in the evening, a bit like taking pills, you know. <laughs> um, so that so that you have time to think them through. Yeah. One more, perhaps. Um, Please. Two more. One. Um, my question is for for Nula um, Grabacco Thurdush. Uh, I did my leaving cert last year, and uh, one of your poems is on the course. My brother said they do be. Yeah, and I just, I just remember I saw a video, you did a video interview about it, and you said oh, you were kind of, you seemed kind of surprised that they'd actually picked that poem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, then nobody asked you, you know. Nobody asked you. You know, they, they, they picked their, the poems away, and nobody asked you. Yeah. yeah um, and I just remember you saying, like, oh, you you had kind of, be, you thought you'd better poems. Well, yeah, much better. I just. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was kind of wondering. If, if it was up to you, what, what poem would you like to have on the course? <laughs> Joe, just because, like, I suppose every student goes through them, every student reads them, you know, so what would you like to well, uh, For a while, the, the um, uh, McGrath, uh, what's the name? Yeah. Um, what's the name of the one? Don de Belissa. Don de Belissa, yeah. That was on the. On the on, on the um, leaving, and it was great because you, you know you can go into a class and you can talk for hours about one one sense of that of that you know 
So, I mean, with my work with, I, I used to go around to different schools, and, and I mean, just, 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 just so easy because, because of the, it was in the book. I mean, the, the poem was in, was full of, you know, I don't know what you call them, mythology and all the rest, and you know, which is what you talk about. And uh, I was kind of, I was kind of pleased with that. And um, the first one, um, um, Ahar. I wasn't really that happy with that. Moher I was. A lot of people thought it was very anti-motherly and all the rest, but you know, that's, you know, fair enough. Um, that's the way it was. And um, yeah, um, Don the Melissa really, I, I was ultimately happy with it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Oh, one big question for David. Um, uh, David, uh, reading salt, it seems the indentation of the lines, the way the lines are laid out, is absolutely essential to them actually working, working well. And uh, I'm wondering, um, is that just the type of poet's intuition uh, when you're deciding how to lay the lines out, or was there some kind of system in place, like the way you use terza rima at times, or um, certain meters? Um, I, 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 I used to use a lot of rhyme, but I, I might well again, I hope I will again. Recently I haven't been rhyming, um, but, but there's a good deal of assonance and so on, I think, in, in, in the work. To me, um, who was it? The land, music before all else. And, um, I have sort of problems with this notion of, of the prose poem. Um, I, I gave a lecture at the university which involved my saying, en passant, at one point, there is no such thing as a prose poem. Mm -hmm. What followed my lecture was a prize for the students, and the students won the prize and written a prose poem. <laughs> <laughs> So much for Professor Harson. Uh, but for me, the, yes, the balance, it, it is to some degree instinctive, of course it is. I mean, because that music has to, you have to find um, that. There's no, there's no plan for it or anything. Well, there is a sort of plan for it. Um, it does have to do with measure, and it does have to do with pulse, and it does have to do with beat. Um, and it does have to do with the way you break a line to instinctively, I usually find, to, to define an effect or, or to, to actually produce a dramatic pause. Um, but although I might challenge the notion of the prose poem, I would certainly accept the notion of lyric prose. And um, which is, I think, what a prose poem is. I mean, what people talk about prose poems, they're really talking about lyric prose. And um, um, for me, what separates poetry from fiction uh, or, or um, creative writing, which is not poetry, <laughs> you want to say, um, is, is music. Um, and prose, of course, has its own music. Of course it does, but it's a different music. It's less intense, I think. Um, and in a mysterious kind of way, it's less productive, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm.